World War II devastated Europe. Even for the Allied victors, conditions were bleak. Cities have been bombed out, inflation was running rampant, and large-scale food shortages lasted for several years. However, nuclear physics was becoming an urgent field of study, with implications for both defense and energy. In 1954, as Europe was recovering, nuclear physicists imagined an organization that would help rebuild the European physics community. The idea was to increase collaboration across Europe and coordinate cost sharing for the expensive infrastructure required. This idea resulted in the formation of the European Organization for Nuclear Research, or CERN, with support from 12 European nations under UNESCO, a brand new agency responsible for science within the United Nations. Today, CERN is the world's largest basic research lab. For more than 50 years, it's been at the forefront of particle physics research, hosting large experiments such as the most powerful accelerator in the world, the Large Hadron Collider, or LHC. It's enormous. Its radius is 27 kilometers, or 16 miles. It took over 10,000 people to build. And the facility itself also crosses the borders of France and Switzerland. You may remember, on July 4, 2012, the LHC enabled the observation of the Higgs boson, the so-called God particle. It had been predicted, but never been observed before. And CERN's research actually has a direct impact on all of our lives. In fact, you might be using it at this very moment to watch this course. Physicists needed to move the data very quickly and share it among many scientists around the world. To do this, they developed something that could connect internet resources at great distances, creating what we now know as the World Wide Web. CERN's history of bringing together international scientists also serves as a model for other international experimental facilities. We've already mentioned the ALMA telescopes in Chile. Another example is the Square Kilometer Array in Southern Africa and Australia. SKA will be the world's biggest radio telescope. It will not only bring much needed scientific activity to the region, but also benefits to the local community. But diplomacy for science isn't just about massive facilities. Diplomacy is also required on a micro level to allow international collaborations to occur. So I'm a scientist and I work on venomous marine snails, which I call killer snails. And I engaged in, in science diplomacy because my snails are found tropically all around the world in any tropical marine beach. And, and those had some issues that comes along with access. So we need export import permits. We need to be able to get our samples in and out of the countries we're going to. We need to ship equipment to these, these samples as well. It involves setting up international collaborations because we use a lot of local experts while we're in the field to help us not only identify what the local habitats of these snails are, but also access the communities in a friendly way. So we're sort of not doing um, what sometimes is referred to as a, um, science colonialism, that we're just coming in, grabbing stuff and leaving and not contributing to the local community. That's not at all what we want. The scientific enterprise is premised on the need to collaborate and connect. Collaborations are no longer based purely on historical, institutional, or cultural links. We've just seen how CERN is a vivid example of diplomacy for science. CERN's unique status as an intergovernmental organization has brought it to a position to promote understanding among nations through scientific research. The formation of CERN so soon after the end of World War II was one way to rebuild trust and relationships between former adversaries. In fact, CERN was also the first place where German and Israeli scientists worked together following the Holocaust. More recently, another science collaboration has enabled Palestinian and Israeli scientists to work side by side. It's located in Jordan and known as Sesame. The synchrotron light 
for experimental science and applications in the Middle East. The scientific leadership involved in establishing SESAME set the stage for the unlikely collaboration of Iranian, Palestinian, and Israeli scientists. At SESAME, scientists from nations with challenging official relationships can work together. The facility is governed by a board that includes one scientist and one diplomat from each of its nine member states. Here we also see how the dimensions of science diplomacy can, and often do, intersect. SESAME and CERN require international agreements to function. That's diplomacy for science. But they also provide an opportunity for scientific collaboration to ease tensions between nations at the national and individual level. This is what we call science for diplomacy.